Hello folks, J. Scott Phillips here. Welcome to my channel. There is a BookTube event going on in the month of August right now called Book Trek. And it was originally started last year, I believe, by Revenant Reads. I came to know this event through watching Steve Donahue's channel. And during Book Trek last year and this year, he was by far the most prolific contributor to this event of all of the hosts uh, for this event. Uh, having a, a book practically every day. Um, so I only started my BookTube channel a few weeks ago. So this year, I'm a little late to the party for Book Trek as well as other BookTube events. But before the month ends here, I wanted to get an entry in for Book Trek. Now, Book Trek in August this year is celebrating the five original runs or original series of the Gene Roddenberry era Star Trek. So that would include the original series with William Shatner and Lennon Nimoy, uh, as well as The Next Generation, uh, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise. Uh, next month, September, is going to cover all of the Kurtzman-era Star Trek and other Star Trek uh, adjacent <laughs> series. Of all the Star Trek series that has ever been, my favorite by far is the original series. I started watching the original series, I can't say from the very beginning, but I was aware of it from the very beginning. I remember seeing ads for it uh, and uh, articles coming out in things like TV Guide talking about how this is going to be the first adult science fiction TV series. And I was, what, I was, I guess... Uh, 11 years old at the time, or 10 years old at the time that it was coming, first coming, about to come out. And I thought, well, that might be a little bit above my my uh, level of, of understanding. I was watching things like Time Tunnel and Lost in Space, and I loved all that. I was interested in Star Trek, but I didn't really worry too much about it. And I didn't catch on to it until some of my friends in the in school were talking about what a great show it was. I came in halfway through the first season. I came in with The Return of the Archons. That was the first episode I watched. And even that one, I came in halfway through in the middle of it. Had no idea what was going on, but I watched it the next week and the next week after that. And it wasn't that far ahead of my own level of uh, reading or of, of paying attention to adult science fiction. Um, so uh, I fell in love with that series and have been following it along ever since. Now, I probably should back up a little bit here uh, with a little little background on what I'm hoping to do more of on my BookTube channel here, and that's to talk about the artwork that was so great in so many books uh, through the years. Um, my, my own background has been in art. When I was in junior high and high school, I started to draw a lot of my own comic strips and got into a kind of a little idea I had for a, a science fiction uh, Flash Gordon type of parody of, of uh, science fiction comic strips. And then uh, took art through college and uh, started out uh, looking to be an illustrator myself, always having loved the illustrations on book covers and in comic books and comic strips, in cartoons, uh, Mad Magazine, you name it. So I was looking to become an illustrator, and uh, I wound up uh, doing some of that, but then fell more into graphic design and ultimately art direction and creative direction in advertising. But I've always loved all those old illustrations, and uh, so one of the things I'm going to try to do on my channel here is to talk about that. So for Book Trek, I'm going to go back... Uh, on this episode here and look at the James Blish run of Star Trek adaptations. I'm not going to get too much into the stories themselves because if you're watching this or if you like Book Trek, you're probably already well familiar with all those stories. But I'm just going to talk about the book covers and uh, little, some of maybe the little stories behind the book covers and the artist that created uh, that artwork. So James Blish got his start writing uh, science fiction when he was just in high school, and he started to write and edit his own uh, fanzine called The Planeteer. And then in the 40s, he got into writing short stories for super science stories, future fiction, 
planet stories eventually on to Astounding and Galaxy and, and many of the others. He's probably best known aside from his Star Trek adaptations, which I'm pretty sure is what he's really best known for uh, today. But he uh, won a Hugo for his novel, A Case of Conscience, and he's also uh, pretty well known for his... Uh, uh, a fix-up novel, Cities in Flight. Now, Star Trek had been out for just a little while, and Bantam Books came to James Blish to commission him to write uh, short story adaptations of a few of the scripts from the TV series. James Blish reportedly had never seen Star Trek before, uh, so he only had the, the drafts of the scripts to go by to write six or seven episodes as short stories for a, the first collection, which was just called Star Trek. The artwork on the cover of Star Trek was created by James Bama. Now, Bantam Books did not commission James Bama to do this artwork. Uh, Bama had originally created it for promotional artwork for NBC. NBC had come to him to promote three series in their 1966 fall lineup. One of them was Star Trek. The other two were The Andy Williams Show and Bonanza. I was a big Bonanza fan also, so I'm, I'm particularly intrigued by his artwork for that show. Um, Obama worked from photographs primarily. He would often shoot his own models, uh, but for the TV shows here that NBC came to him for, they just provided him photography for that they had been using to promote the show. But for the Bonanza one, Bama, his, his approach to that was to create kind of a Mount Rushmore effect uh, in, in creating the, our, our three heroes in the background in kind of stony blue colors. And then he puts that little exciting shot uh, in front of it to create a montage with, with some action. James Bama had already been a pretty prolific illustrator for, for years. He never really got into science fiction very much at all. He had a, a few entries, Doc Savage probably being the most, the biggest science fiction run that he's well known for. He did dozens of illustrations for that, but not really much else in, in the genre of science fiction. He, Although he did get his start drawing in high school, he would try to copy uh, Alex Raymond's Flash Gordon comic strip, and he and a, another high school friend of his who also liked to draw, they would have kind of competitions to see who could draw the best Flash Gordon. Getting back to Bama's artwork for Star Trek, this was commissioned by NBC to promote the premiere of Star Trek. The show had not come out yet, so no one was really familiar with it. Uh, and they really pulled most of the photography that Bama could use as reference from publicity shots and still uh, screen captures from frames of the uh, second pilot episode where no man has gone before, which uh, is not even one of the stories that appears in the James Blish adaptation in the first uh, book, Star Trek. But here we can see some of the reference that they had given him. Of course, the Starship Enterprise there, which was probably the one of the few shots that was used by most illustrators back in those days. Uh, and then uh, a, a shot of uh, William Shatner as Kirk leaning over the console is where Bama <laughs> pulled uh, Jim Kirk's head right off there. Over here we see a shot of Spock and Sulu. That's where we get the reference for uh, Leonard Nimoy. And then in the background we can kind of see our late lamented friend uh, Kelso uh, in the back with his communicator. In the back, I don't have a, a shot that uh, Bama might have used for the reference for Sally Kellerman in the background, but she can be seen in in the background there. And this book was being put together for publication. They just pulled existing artwork in order to get uh, a book out on the, on the shelves because they didn't know if this book was going to sell very well. But one of the art directors at Bantam saw this artwork and asked, why can't we get this kind of artwork for all of our books? Not even really knowing that at the time, James Bama was already doing a lot of covers for Bantam. But uh, this particular one was, as I say, not commissioned for the book. They were able to pull it cheaply from uh, the archives that NBC provided for them. So it was already created artwork. In fact, Bama had already been freelancing covers for Bantam Books uh, as early as 1965. 
And I want to show this one cover here. This was his second book cover that he ever did for Bantam Books. And it was for a book called Tomboy by Hal Elson, which was a kind of a juvenile delinquent story. That was a popular genre back in the day then, uh, Blackboard Jungle and books like that. But for the photo shoot that he directed for reference for this cover, he used model actress Andrea Drum, who played Yeoman Smith in Where No Man Had Gone Before. So there's another early Star Trek tie-in for uh, James Bama. Star Trek was still on the air during its first run on network television in 1967 when Blish's book came out. But the book was selling well enough that Bantam thought that it was probably worthwhile to do it again. So in February of 68 and April of 69, they came out with Star Trek II and Star Trek III. Now, during this time, still during Star Trek's first run on, on television, the show itself kept trying to get canceled. It, it was always rumored that it was going to be going off the air, and then it was really only a letter-writing campaign that uh, had it come back for a third season in uh, the 68-69 the season. Uh, so I think that's why Bantam didn't go and commission original artwork for these. They just used uh, production stills from uh, NBC and uh, called it a day. However, Star Trek 2 and 3, as kind of plain as the covers are, it did establish this interesting vertical slice that they continued to use throughout the run of the Blish adaptations with that big serif display number two or three or four on down the line. They continued to do that throughout, throughout the uh, initial run of the books. Just about the time that Star Trek III came out in April of 69, the show had been canceled and that was it. There weren't gonna be any new episodes of, of uh, Captain Kirk and the Starship Enterprise. But the books were selling pretty well because it was the only place that fans at that time then could go and uh, experience Star Trek at all. But then in, in the fall of 1970, Star Trek, the first three seasons of the original run, went into syndication, and it really caught fire then. And the books were selling well, and there seemed to be a huge popularity of the syndicated Star Trek. And... So Bantam decided, well, it's time for Star Trek IV to come out. And that's when we got this cover. First published in July of 1971, the cover art was created by Lou Feck. And what a beautiful cover. I remember finding this in, I think it was a, a Pickwick bookstore in uh, Orange, California. I saw that on the, on the book racks and I just, my eyes popped out. This was the first time that I had ever really gotten to see the Enterprise in such a setting like this. It was just beautiful. My little art student eyes were, were bugging out. Looking at the, the planets behind it, the, the planet or moon, whatever that is behind the Enterprise, looks like it's made out of a, like a metallic mesh or something with a nebula smoking off behind it or off of it somehow. Uh, a terrestrial planet down below with, with mountains and things. So it looked like there was a, a natural planet or moon or planetoid with an artificial one behind it. Don't know the story behind this. It doesn't really reflect any of the stories in the book. It was just evocative of Star Trek in such a way that it just, it, you, even though the, the stories in the, in the book were all episodes that we knew and we're now getting to watch again in syndication, had to have this book just for the cover alone. I just love this this cover. Would be a great poster, and I think they even printed this later on as a poster that you could get to, to hang up on your wall. This was a really simple cover for uh, Lou Feck. He usually painted uh, people in his illustrations. This was back in the heyday of the illustration, illustrated stories, fiction in men's magazines, adventure magazines, paperback books, lots of illustrations, usually having a person, a character, or people in them. So the Star Trek one was a really nice, clean, and elegant uh, painting, really. Uh, Lufek painted a lot of those adventure story illustrations, double-page spreads and things, as well as paperback books. He usually worked in 
gouache and acrylics because they dried so quickly, a lot of uh, deadlines in his world. Here are some examples of some of Lufeck's work for magazines uh, in particular, just to get a kind of a sense of his overall style. He also worked from photos of models like James Bama did and uh, uh, composed them in such a way to leave room for the type and all that. As, a, as an illustrator and, and uh, uh, art director myself, I really appreciate artwork like this. It's so bold. It also gives you room for, for the, the copy and all that. Just beautiful stuff, uh, and yet simple, not overcomplicated. And then uh, some of his paperback book covers here are somewhat iconic. I mean, who hasn't seen a lot of the uh, Clive Cussler, Dirk Pitt books? He did some of those. Uh, he did a, a, an early cover for uh, a Canical for Leibowitz, and then that famous Jaws 2 cover. Some of the others there, he did a lot of westerns, and that uh, type of, of uh, book covers. Uh, very prolific uh, was uh, uh, Lou Feck. The books continued to sell well and uh, bolstered by the popularity of the syndication of Star Trek. In February of 1972, Star Trek V came out. This time the cover art was by Mitchell Hooks. And uh, I really like this cover, not as well as I like the Lou Feck cover though. Uh, but uh, still very striking. I really like the greens and the oranges in this. And again, it doesn't really represent a story, a particular story from the uh, collection of, of uh, adaptations inside the book, but it's still very evocative of Star Trek. It had a feel for it. Although there's a, a few things not quite right here. We've got the Enterprise very close to the surface of a, of a planet or a moon or something there. And then uh, we can kind of see a little swirly line under the engineering hull there. It looks like it might be beaming down one of the one of the landing crew or spacemen or whoever these guys are. Those spacesuits are not anything we ever saw in Star Trek. But still, again, I I don't think that the studio or anybody gave uh, Mitchell Hooks any reference material other than the ubiquitous Enterprise there that everybody had a shot of. Uh, so he just kind of made some things up there. I do like the surface of the planet here. It's a kind of a, a abstract landscape there. It looks like it was probably made of torn bits of paper that were shellacked together on top of each other. So you can kind of see the, the colors bleeding through the layers. Uh, but uh, the, the the orange of the nacelles and the deflector dish there with the with the planet and then the highlights of the orange on the planets up in the sky there. Really nice. Mitchell Hook's style was a little looser than uh, Bama's or Lou Feck's. He used a broader brush stroke or a dry brush stroke or kind of a sketchier style. And uh, just to give you an idea of what his typical style was when he's not painting spaceships, uh, here's some more typical types of work that he did. He did a series of covers for the Lou Archer books by Ross MacDonald. And uh, here the composition is similar to the James Bama Star Trek cover, but you can just see they're kind of flatter, sketchier, broader stroke colors and, and compositions, but still nice and clean and very saleable on the bookshelves and the bookstores in those days. Hooks did paint a lot of book covers in his day, absolutely, but he was primarily known for his movie posters. He was one of the go-to illustrators for the studios in those days. And one of the big feathers in his cap was he was the first ever to paint Sean Connery's James Bond 007. And here we see the first poster ever by Mitchell Hooks uh, for Dr. No. And that's the first time that we really got to see the Sean Connery James Bond in all his tuxedo glory there. Now, uh, he was probably working from photos, so I don't think that he invented the, the the classic pose of James Bond with the elbow on the hand of the other arm, with holding the gun up in the air, resting against his cheek and all that. I'm sure that was uh, shot by the studio. But this was really the first time we got to see it uh, before the movies came out. A couple of months later, after Star Trek V came out, Star Trek VI came out in April of 1972, and we're back to Lou Feck, and again, another beautiful cover. To me, when this book came out, I could not stop looking at this cover. It just 
fired my imagination in a lot of ways. Again, it really talked to the just the the style and meaning of Star Trek, at least to me. But here we now we can start to see some people on the cover, and it appears that they're in the act of beaming up or down. We see. I guess Mr. Spock here, we see a, a green-faced somebody with a pointed ear. Uh, and then I would assume that's Kirk in the middle there with his arms folded in a kind of a dynamic pose there. And then the figure in, in, in the further in the back there looks like that's probably Scotty. Kind of hard to tell. But the thing that I really loved about this cover was that we had our landing party standing on the surface of a planet in apparently broad daylight, but yet there's no blue sky. It's just all space, almost like you're on the moon. And there was just something about that that uh, that odd setting with space in the sky instead of blue blue skies and clouds, or more often, like you would see in a Star Trek episode, a red sky uh, and streaks of light or something. And then there we have the Enterprise up there, again, kind of like, I didn't mention this on the Bama illustration, but he had those rocket jets coming out of the nacelles in the, in the back of the engineering section on the Enterprise on his painting. Didn't know any better in those days, but there were no rocket jets. Here again, we've got the rocket jets. Somehow it worked okay for me when I saw this. I was forgiving of some of the uh, adaptations or the, the creative license that, that Feck was taking here. The one thing that bothers me a little bit about the Enterprise is it looks like the nacelles are lying a little too flat, but it's just such a gorgeous cover. All those limited palette of the blues and all that with just little hints of color here and there to give it some life. I just love this, this cover. I, I was a, an art student in, in high school just at the time, and I remember taking this book in and showing it to a, a, a friend of mine who was another big Star Trek fan. And we wanted to write this story that, that, again, is not in the book itself, but just evocative of that kind of a thing. Just a beautiful cover. Banda must have been pretty happy with their book sales for the Star Trek series, because just three months after Star Trek VI came out, they came out with Star Trek Seven in July of 72. And this time the cover is a little different. It's by J.H. Breslow. And this is the first time that we see an actual story or an episode in the book depicted on the cover. A very specific story. And in this case, it's Who Mourns for Adonais. And so that must be Apollo in the background there. And uh, then we see a, a scene depicted in the episode where... He is clutching the Starship Enterprise in his hand. He's got control of the ship, and it can't do anything as long as it's in his clutches. But aside from the style of this, which is fairly abstract for the covers that we've seen before, a kind of a pop art style, typical of the 70s, but the hand that is clutching the Enterprise is a left hand. If that's actually Apollo in the background, and he's supposed to be holding the Enterprise... There's no way he could twist his left hand around to have it coming from his right side. So is that some somebody else holding the Enterprise out in front of him? Or is that Apollo's hand and that's somebody else in the background looking at the Starship Enterprise? That just always really bugged me. It's a really interesting cover otherwise, but that backwards hand just kind of throws me. I wasn't real happy with the flesh-colored Enterprise either. That that just didn't feel right. But uh, So I'm kind of torn on this cover. Really interesting, fits in nicely with the, with the series of covers so far, but the execution of it uh, has me scratching my head a little bit. Breslow did not do a lot of covers. He wasn't active for very long, only from 1972 to 1975. He did do a number of science fiction and fantasy covers during that time, though. And so I'll show some examples real quick here of, of some of his work, just to uh, see it in context with his uh, Apollo cover. His style was a little psychedelic around the edges, which probably is why he did more fantasy covers than science fiction and what probably made him a good choice for the Apollo cover for the Star Trek VII. Uh, when I was trying to find some examples of his work, he seemed to do a, a number of covers for the Andre Norton uh, Witch World series. And at one point when I was looking him up, I came across a note that I thought it said that he was Illustrator of the Year, but it turned out that 
<laughs> if I read further, he was just illustrator of the year of the unicorn. Uh, so I took a step back there for a second. But uh, his style is interesting and colorful. I like it. Uh, not really science fiction in a lot of cases, although you can see some Philip K. Dick there and some Paul Anderson, but was more of a fantasy illustrator than anything. Then later that year, in November of 72, we got Star Trek VIII and back to Lou Feck again. And look at this cover, another great Lou Feck cover. Kind of like the Star Trek movies where all the even-numbered movies were considered to be the best. To me, the even-numbered Star Trek adaptations, starting with number four, were all the best with these Lou Feck covers. This is just great with that all that red and those bizarre stalagmite formations coming up out of the ground. Don't know who this crewman here is. He's not one of the regular command crew. Must be a red shirt, and in uh, Lou Feck's case here, a red pants as well. But he's just down there by himself. They've sent him down on some kind of a recon mission or a survey or something. We don't know. Again, the story's not in the book. But what a great shot, just full of to me, just full of wonder and imagination here. We, again, have the, uh, I won't say it's broad daylight, but we have the nighttime sky up above him. So, it just such a, a rich concept there. We, It looks like we're looking at the floor of a cave, but we don't have a roof of a cave. It's just space. Just beautiful. I, 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 <laughs> I can't gush about that this uh, cover enough. Well, we can nitpick a little bit here. Here's the Enterprise on, on Star Trek VI. We saw that, uh, to me, the nacelles looked like they were a little too flat. Now, in this case, he might be overcompensating. They look a little too close together on this one, but uh, it doesn't matter. We've, we've, even we've got those rocket jets coming out of the, the nacelles again. Doesn't matter. What a cover. Just a, a, one of the best Star Trek covers of all time, I think are these three done by Lou Feck. The next three, I'm gonna just cover all together. To me, they're a step back from the covers we've had up until now. Star Trek's nine, 10, and 11 were all illustrated by Eddie Jones or uh, his pen name that he often used was S. Fantoni. And I think he used that name because he was originally a, a fan artist uh, and then started to work uh, commercially. But uh, Eddie Jones did all three of these covers, and they're okay, I think, but this is about the time that the plastic model kits came out for the Enterprise and for the Klingon Battle Cruiser. And I'm looking at these covers, and I just can't help but think that he's just looking at the models themselves for reference. There's really nothing, uh, there's really no evocative sense of Trek in Star Trek in these to me. They're just depictions of the spaceships. Uh, we do have a weird kind of a Richard Powers uh, swirly building or structure down on the bottom of Star Trek 9 and some glowing lights in the background. Again, not indicative of any of the episodes in the, uh, in the book unless you're really looking at kind of an abstract way of uh, connecting them. Star Trek 10, we do get a nice little space battle there, but it's really kind of between the eyes. It's There's not much action or, or intrigue about the painting. It looks like just a, a static models that uh, he took a little license with the Klingon nacelle getting busted apart there, but no real action, no real emotion in, in any of these covers. Star Trek Eleven, very similar to Star Trek Nine. Uh, an odd little artifact floating out there in front of the model of the Starship Enterprise there again. And uh, that's about all I can really say about these. There, there's nothing wrong with them other than in comparison to the covers that had come before. And then in November of 1977, it's been a long haul so far, we get the last numbered of the Star Trek series, Star Trek 13, with a horrible cover. This is the worst cover of the run and maybe one of the worst in the entire series of Star Trek paperbacks, whether it's Bantam or, or Pocketbooks or whoever might do them. The shot of the Enterprise here is, is uh, uh, ambitious. It's a nice angle of the Enterprise, but the technique in rendering it is 
just bad. The perspective is off. We've got one cell going that way. We got another cell going this way. I know the artist was trying to, and I should say, the artist is uncredited here. So I don't feel bad at all about about being completely honest about this painting. The, I, you can tell that the artist was trying to go for that perspective of the nacelles. Like, it's not an unfamiliar angle of, of, the, of the Enterprise. But they just don't line up to any vanishing point. The, uh, the, the technique of painting the details on the ship itself is just poor. The saucer is pointing one way. The ship is pointing another way. The, it's just... I, I just... I want to have a clothespin on my nose while I'm talking about this cover. The planet in the back, that red planet, that's okay. The nebula in the in the distance, that's okay. But thank God this was the last cover. I, as much as I was raving about those Lufet covers, I'm the opposite on this one. Uh, but in April of 1978, we finally got the long-awaited last entry of the James Blish adaptations, although technically not a James Blish adaptation. For several years, Blish's health had been failing him, and probably around uh, Star Trek three or four in that area somewhere, his health was getting bad enough that he wasn't able to do all of the work himself, and his wife, J.A. Lawrence, was pitching in to help him finish the stories. She was never credited until this last edition here, Mud's Angels. And the story is that uh, Blish had been holding off in having or including the the two Harry Mud episodes from the series uh, so that he could write a third kind of a short story or novelette to go with it somehow as a, as a sequel or a, a, maybe not a, a literal sequel, but a follow-up to his novel Spock Must Die, which had come out uh, I think after Star Trek three didn't talk about that because it wasn't one of the adaptations. It was an original novel, but he had been waiting to do that. And in the meantime, before he got around to doing that or before uh, J.A. Lawrence was ghostwriting it for him as one of the numbered series, uh, he passed away. So uh, Mud's Angels came out posthumously and it's just credited entirely to J.A. Lawrence. Uh, she, 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 finished up the series. I still consider it, I think most people consider it part of the run of the Blish adaptations, but let's talk about the cover here. We've gotten away now on this cover from the numbered format that we've seen on all the books leading up till this one now. It's not Star Trek 13. It's just called Mud's Angels because this the stories in this book, there are three of them. Uh, are only about Harry Mudd <clears throat> on the Enterprise or dealing with Kirk. And that gave illustrator Bob Larkin here a chance to use more space on the cover. He doesn't have that big number 13 to work around here, which probably would have fallen on the back of the Enterprise. Instead, he can use that space, no pun intended, to, uh, to uh, make his characters larger down there. So we see Roger C. Carmel as Harry Mudd, uh, a thinner Roger C. Carmel, I think, than we're used to seeing, surrounded by his bevy of young lovelies on what I imagine must be the planet surface of Rigel 12, which was the planet depicted in Mud's Women, the very first Harry Mud story in Star Trek. I think he really captures the personality of Harry Mud and, and uh, the young ladies there really well. And Bob Larkin is a good choice for this because he was mostly known for doing, uh, he was a comic book artist primarily, and he's probably best known for his Marvel magazine format cover paintings. They weren't the line drawings and ink drawings of the comic books. Those uh, magazine, those Marvel magazines back in the 70s had uh, fully painted covers just like the paperbacks did. And so just for some context, here's a few examples of some of those where we really can see, in some cases, very specific facial features of, that are recognizable to us. And then after the Blish adaptation series had run out, Bantam wanted to continue publishing Star Trek books because it was just so popular in syndication now uh, that they started to come out with their own original novels. <clears throat> and uh, Larkin was tapped to come back and illustrate a number of those. 
And they're some of the best ones, I think, because he really depicted the characters or uh, the characters from the from the stories and from the TV show without doing just uh, kind of a phony baloney uh, composite painting of heads of the characters around a somewhere working in the Enterprise flying through space or behind the characters or something. Those always seemed a little cheaper to me, but in, in Larkin's case, he actually tried to depict characters and scenes from the stories themselves. And I think uh, those are some of the better covers from the Bantam run uh, before, they, before the license turned over to pocketbooks later on. So after all that, I think looking back, James Bama, of all the illustrators in this series, is probably my favorite artist. But amongst the Star Trek covers themselves, to me, Lou Feck is the clear standout. He really captured an essence of Star Trek, just the feeling that the show gave me, at least, when I was watching it back in the original run and in the early years of syndication. He really captured the, the feel of Star Trek for me on those covers. So, uh, do you have any favorite Star Trek artists uh, that you like or prefer, or any of these really uh, hitting you where you live? Uh, let me know down in the comments below if you like that. I really enjoy talking about the cover art of the books that uh, we can chat about here on, on BookTube. So, I hope you enjoy it like I do, and uh, some of these artists that I just talked about probably deserve videos all on their own. So I'm looking forward to maybe doing some of those down the line. But there you have it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, tune back in again. And I hope to see you soon. Thanks a lot.